Hi, my name is Jessica Nishikawa. I'm going to be performing a few of the basic techniques for the head and neck examination. These videos are meant to supplement your learning and are not intended to be completely comprehensive or replace your readings or lectures. Hi, Miley. My name is Jessica. I'm going to be the nurse practitioner today that's performing your head and neck exam. I'm going to start with your head, then just move down to your eyes, your nose, your throat, your ears, and then uh, your neck, okay? All right. If you have any questions while I'm doing this, feel free to stop me. I'm first, um, oh, and I'm, I'm going to be speaking uh, so that the cameras can hear me, so that the people um, that are watching these videos can learn, okay? I'm going to be starting with your head exam. Uh, first, inspecting, looking at your hair distribution, at the shape and contour of your skull, uh, and then I'm going to be palpating your skull, feeling for any lumps, any bumps, feeling for the contours, any depressions, your normal occiput back here. Good, and then moving down to your face. First, inspecting for symmetry, looking um, for any <clears throat> facial, involuntary facial movements, um, any scarring or lesions, crushing of your eyebrows or eyelashes. Uh, and then at this point, I'm going to feel uh, at your temporal pulse, feeling for your temporal artery, moving down, feeling your, for t uh, what we call temporal mandibular joint, your TMJ. Go ahead and open and close for me. And cl open and close one more time. Good, good. And then I'm going to be palpating your sinuses, both your frontal and your maxillary sinuses. Feeling for any pressure, any pain? Any pain there? No. Good. So um, next we're going to be moving on to your eye exam. Uh, first, just inspecting again, as we always start with inspections, inspecting your eyebrows and your eyelashes, uh, and then moving on to the internal structures, looking at your sclera, um, looking for color. It should be nice and white, shouldn't have any yellowing or jaundice. Pulling down slightly on your on your um, lower eyelids, looking at your palpebral conjunctiva, looking again at the color. Um, shouldn't notice any pale. It shouldn't be pale. It should be nice and pink, which yours is. Next, I'm going to grab a light source here. In this case, my um, otoscope, and going to just be taking a look at your lens and your pupil. Can look um, at the lighting obliquely to look for any form bodies. Again, assessing for um, symmetry from one side to the next, looking for um, any color differences or any form bodies. While my pen lights out, I'm going to step back and shine my light um, at your eyes and have you look directly into the light. And I'm looking for the reflex in your, um, in your pupils. The, the light reflection from this uh, light source should be slightly nasal on both sides and should be uh, symmetrical on both sides, which yours is. Um, while my pen lights out, I'm also going to take a look at your pupils, looking for your pupillary responses, making sure that they are equally round and reactive to light, both direct light and consensual light. So you shine your light into the right eye or your left eye and the left eye pupil should constrict shine the light into your left eye again and the right pupil should constrict and then shine the light into your, your right eye and the left pupil should, could, should constrict shine the light into your right eye again and the right pupil should constrict that's direct and consensual uh, light reaction I'm done with my little pen light next I'm going to check your visual fields first I'm going to check uh, your peripheral vision this is done by confrontation confrontation testing. Uh, I'm going to get somewhat close to you and then put my hands on the side of your, your face. And then tell me when you can see my hands. Just look directly into my eyes or directly at my nose and tell me when you can see my fingers. No. Good. And then I'm switching, I'm switching and uh, moving my fingers, uh, my hands to her superior and, and posterior view. So tell me again when you can see. No. Good. No. Very good. So your peripheral view is intact. The next uh, thing I'm going to test is uh, the six cardinal views of gaze. This tests your extraocular muscles and your extraocular movement. So just follow my finger and we're going to test the six different cardinal views. So out, lateral, high and low, back to midline, back to middle, across her view, a high and low back to midline and back to the middle. At this point, I'm going to ask you to follow my finger in as I um, bring it towards the bridge of your nose. While you do this, you're looking, for, uh, you're looking for convergence that her eyes will converge and follow your finger to within five to about 15 centimeters. 
Good. I'm also looking at the same time that her pupils constrict. If you can't see that, you can do what's called a near test uh, in which I'll have you look at my finger and then look at an object far in the distance. Good, and then back at my finger and then far. And her eyes should, her pupils should constrict with near effort. So you'll see that her pupils get smaller when she looks at my finger and then they expand when she looks away or dilate when they look away. Good. Okay. Uh, so those were all the tests to assess your extraocular mu muscle movements, um, which completes the basic eye exam. We're now going to move to the fundoscopic exam. The next portion of the exam is um, the fundoscopic exam. I have uh, the my ophthalmoscope here. You'll need to get familiar with whatever ophthalmoscope you're going to be using, uh, including how to turn it on. And then the diopters here, and the diopters on the side, there's a dial on the side. You'll want to set it to zero to start off with. And then you can turn the diopters right or left depending on, um, to bring blurry objects into focus. So Miley, I'm gonna have you just look straight at that clock back there. Um, as the examiner, you will come in at an angle about um, 15 degrees, bring your um, left hand on the patient's shoulder or on the patient's head with your thumb above their eyebrow. Put the ophthalmoscope to your eye. If you're assessing the patient's right eye, you'll want to use your right eye. Bring the ophthalmoscope to your right eye. Look for the red reflex, which is the light shining into the patient's pupil. Once you see that red reflex, which is red or sometimes a yellow or an orange, follow that red reflex all the way in until you're very close to the patient. Once you're in, you can make small adjustments in your movement. Make sure you move your head and your ophthalmoscope together or else you're going to uh, lose the movements. When you're in, once you get through the red reflex and, and are looking in the back of her pupil, you'll see the blood vessels uh, and you can follow those blood vessels to look at the disc, the optic disc and the uh, physiologic cup. Once you're in there, you can move slightly nasal to see the macula and the fovea. When you switch to the opposite eye, again, you um, use your left eye when you're assessing the patient's left eye. And this is obviously so um, for comfort for you and the patient, but also because you don't want to bump in, you know, you don't want your, your and the patient's noses to be bumping together. That makes for an awkward situation. So that was the ophthalmoscope um, exam. And with that, I'm going to move on to um, examining your ears. Okay, uh, like every exam, we start off with inspection, just looking at the placement of your ears, looking at the external canals for any uh, discharge, drainage, signs of infection, or inflammation. I'm going to perform the whisper test. Occlude, uh, you can either occlude the patient's ear or have the patient occlude their own ear. Occlude the ear, and I'm going to whisper a common two syllable phrase like apple or baseball, and have Miley um, tell me what I said. Apple. Good. And then you'd repeat the same on the opposite ear. Baseball. Baseball. Very good. Next, I'm going to um, what, do what we call the tug test, where I take the pinna with my hand and just lightly tug back up and down on the oracle or the pinna. Uh, if there's any pain there, that can lead you to, um, that can indicate some inflammation and possible infection in the internal canal. So always do the tug test before you go ahead and put the um, the scope into the ear. I'm going to grab my otoscope, put on the speculum. You want to use the largest speculum that you can that will fit comfortably into the patient's ear. On adults, you'll uh, grab the pinna and you'll pull up and back. With children, you'll pull down and back, and that will just straighten out the external canal. With my pen, with my otoscope on, pulling back and up on her ear, inserting the scope and looking into her external canal and finding her tympanic membrane. Just going to take a look at this ear. And note how I'm bracing against, I'm pulling up and back with my left hand on her ear. With my right hand, the hand that has the otoscope with it, I'm bracing against the side of her face. I do this so that the scope isn't going to get out of my hand and jam into her ear, which is very uncomfortable. This is really important when you're seeing pediatric patients as they're constantly moving their heads and you don't want to cause any trauma to their external ear canal. When you're looking at the um, internal 
um, air canal and finding the tympanic membrane. It's important to look at the um, specific structures of the tympanic membrane, including the bony provenances of the malleus, the handle of the malleus and the umbo, looking for the light reflex um, and all the different structures there, look, assessing for any redness. It should be a nice pearly white color, which yours were. Um, and if it was red or bulging, that can um, indicate some signs of infection. The last parts of the ear exam um, are done using the tuning fork. Uh, this is how we test what's called Weber and Rin test. Weber test um, assesses for conduction into the ear. I'm going to uh, strike the tuning fork and place it in on her forehead or on the t top of her crown of the head and ask her which ear she hears or feels it in. Which ear do you hear that in? In both. She should hear it in both, just as she does equally. Uh, you're you're um, testing to see if there's any lateralization to one ear or the next, which can uh, indicate some uh, hear different types of hearing loss. The RIN test is a test um, used the tuning fork where we strike the tuning fork and place the tuning fork on the back of Miley's ear on the bone and ask her when she can no longer hear it. No. And then place the tuning fork in front of her ear. Can you hear it? Mm -hmm. and she should still be able to hear the vibration. This is because bone conduction, air conduction, should be greater than bone conduction. So AC, or air conduction, should be greater than bone conduction, or BC. So AC is greater than BC. Again, you would do that on both sides. Strike the tuning fork, place it on the mastoid bone behind the ear. Once she can no longer hear it, place it in front of the ear until she can no longer hear it again. Okay, that concludes the ear exam. We're going to move on to the nose, examination of the nose. Again, inspecting the nose from the outside, looking for any um, obvious deformity, looking at the ala. Uh, everything looks good. Going to have you flex your neck slightly so I can look up the end. Take your um, left hand or non-dominant hand and press up slightly on the nose. Take your light source with a specula on it and place it inside the nostril, the nares, Looking at the um, mucosa, looking at the turbinates, looking for any polyps or any abnormal discharge. The mucosa in the nose is slightly um, slightly less red than it is in the in the throat, so it might look a little bit pink. Shouldn't be quite as red. It, the nose is very vascular, though, so be careful when you're inserting the speculum. You don't want to insert the speculum all the way um, as far in as you can, or else you're going to abrade the um, the uh, terminates, and they're going to bleed. Uh, while I was in looking in Miley's nose, I was looking at her septum, looking for any septal deviation from one side or the other as well. Moving on to the mouth and throat. Uh, looking at the external mouth, looking for um, at the lips, looking for cracking, looking for any sores, um, herpetic lesions, that sort of thing. And then I'm going to have uh, Miley open her mouth. I'm going to take my light and look in and take, take your tongue out and say, ah. Uh. Good. This allows me to, um, allows her throat to open up and I can look into the back of her throat, looking at her tonsils, her pillars. Uh, the uvula that should be midline, looking at the hard and soft palates, looking at her dentition and all of the mucosa. Um, I'm going to put a glove on and just feel some of the um, mucosa, um, feeling for any induration or masses. Go ahead and open. Good. Good. And lift up on your tongue. And I'm looking at um, the ducts where the submandibular and sublingual um, gland ducts are underneath her tongue as well. The final part of the head neck exam is the neck exam. I'm going to start with inspection, inspection of the neck uh, for alignment, uh, making sure that the trachea is midline, there's no masses, lesions, uh, torticollis, which would be a twisting of the neck, um, and then I'm going to palpate. Palpate the neck. Um, all the lymph nodes, I'm going to start with the preauricular, which means pre, before, before the ear, palpating. When I'm palpating for the lymph nodes, I'm using the pads of three fingers, two to three fingers, and then just using kind of a circular motion, preauricular, and then post or behind, postauricular, and then moving down to the tonsillar and submandibular, submental, right below her chin, 
and then anterior cervical. Posterior cervical is behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Deep cervical, you can't feel until, um, unless you have Miley, go ahead and turn your head one way. And the way she turns her head, you'll want to kind of press into those, the sternocleidomastoid muscle and you can sometimes feel a deep cervical there. Go ahead and turn the other way. But a lot of times the deep cervical are deep, so you won't be able to feel them. Uh, the supraclavicular, supra means above, so above the clavicle, supraclavicular, and infraclavicular, or below the clavicle. Finally, the occipital, behind the neck. Okay. And you're feeling for any lymph nodes, which are going to be P size or larger. Um, if they are normal lymph nodes, they'll be um, mo mobile, they'll be non-tender. Uh, sometimes they can be tender, fixed, and hard. Uh, those ones are more worrisome and require for their workup. Uh, the next step is to um, palpate the trachea and the thyroid. I'm going to start with the trachea and just displace it to one side and then the other. Make, feeling that, palpating that it's midline. The next part is to um, assess the, the um, thyroid. I'm going to have you just scoot a little that way. Good, so I can take a look. Um, with both hands, you're going to sit behind the patient and apply your hands below the isthmus of the thyroid. The correct, you can feel the cricoid cartilage go right below that. And on each side, you can feel where the thyroid is. You can have the patient swallow. That will bring the isthmus up. Go ahead and swallow, Miley. Good, and it'll slide up between your fingers and then down back between your fingers again. So this is one way. You can also check it, that's the posterior approach. You can also check it anteriorly by just side to side. You're feeling the lobes of the, thyrus, of the thyroid for any um, lumps, any nodules, any bumps, any tenderness that the patient might be experiencing. This exam isn't comfortable, so they might have some discomfort, but it shouldn't be painful. You can also uh, inspect for um, a goiter, which if there's a large goiter, you should be able to visually see it. Okay, that concludes our head and neck exam. Thank you.